morning, church. Ah, it always helps to turn it on. It is good to see you guys. In the Middle East, it was always, every Sunday morning we got to gather. It was just such a, a time that we could be thankful that we got to gather together as a church because you never knew what would happen from week to week. I come to back to Mayfoot. I didn't think that would be an issue, but since we now live in Tornado Alley, I am thankful now to be here on this Sunday morning to see all of your beautiful smiling faces out there because last week was not very fun to be here alone with our few of our friends. We got some kind of crazy fly up here trying to get me. All right. So if you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn to John chapter 3. We're going to start in, verse, or we're going to start in John chapter 3, but I also want you to flip over to Romans chapter 10, and we're going to read verses out of both of those passages, so you can kind of be getting your Bibles, finding those places. John chapter 3 and Romans chapter 10. Now, we've been doing this series, if you're new with us, it's called The 12 Characteristics of a Healthy Church. We really want to just walk through these basic foundational things that make a church healthy. And we know a lot of these characteristics. We've, we've heard about a lot of these characteristics, but it was just an opportunity for me to gather with the church and explain my heart for the church and to, for us really to get on the same page on what it means uh, to disciple what it means to, to be a church that's focused on biblical evangelism. And so we've been looking at these characteristics. And the first week, if you remember, we, we talked about biblical preaching and teaching, which really centered on the Word of God. We made statements that this is the very breath of God. And if this is the very breath of God, church, this should inform a lot of what we do and who we are. Then we moved on to evangelism. And the, although a very difficult thing, I think as we look through the Scriptures I want our church to be marked by this characteristic of evangelism. It's essential for us as Christians. And then last week, in the last few weeks, we looked at the, the characteristic of discipleship. We really looked on what does it actually mean to be a disciple, and then after we defined that, then we saw what it meant to make other disciples. That's where we've been so far, and today we're going to do the characteristic of missions. Now, as you can imagine, this characteristic is very near and dear to my heart. And so I began to prepare the message for this week, and I just couldn't fit it into one. So instead of preaching an hour and a half sermon, I put it into two. Thank, thank, okay, thank you. Yeah. I knew someone would tell me thank you, so for your own sake. And so I divided it up into two weeks, so hopefully I'll give you about a 35-minute version this week, and then next week we'll do another Sermon on Missions as well. Really, I'm breaking this up into kind of two parts. I want us to begin to see missions through a new lens. I want to try to introduce you just a new perspective on missions. And then from that, next week, we're going to look at, okay, now that we have this new perspective, how do we as a church respond? That's kind of where we're going for the next two weeks. We're going to be in John chapter 3 and Romans 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 13 today. John chapter 3. Verse 13, it's going to be a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I think sometimes we get so focused on 16 that we miss a lot of the verses around this. Verse 13 says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. I'm going to flip over to Romans chapter 10 now. Another very familiar passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 13, says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise God. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Pray with me, church. God, we are so thankful for your word. I pray you would just allow it to speak to us today, God, really to change our perspectives, to change our vision. God, we need you. God, we need your spirit this morning to teach us. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I don't know if you knew this about me or not, but I am pretty blind. I don't know what it means to be legally blind. Maybe someone can help me out there, but I have to be real close. When I take my contacts out, I have contacts in, thank goodness, right? When I take my contacts out, beyond six inches, I don't have much going on, okay? I wouldn't be able to pick one single person out in this room. It's so funny, when I have to go, go get glasses, I always, you know, if you've ever been to get glasses, they have this chart on how thin do you want your lenses. I have to go for the thinnest kind and pay the extra money, and I still look like I got Coke bottles on my, on my frames. Like I'm blind. I, I can't see, but I know I can't see. I'm to the point in my life that, that I know I have to have glasses and I have to have contacts in order to function. I know I'm blind because I know what it's like to now see. But there was a time in my life that I didn't know that I was blind because I didn't know what it was like to clearly see. When I was about fourth or fifth grade, my parents took me to the eye doctor here in Mayfield. I think it was the eye doctor around where the old church building is at now. I say old church building. It's the same church building, just not the one we're currently in now. Anyways, um, so my parents took me to this, this eye doctor, and I remember, you know, he did the test. One, what do you see better? One, two, one, two. At the end... I get these nice pair of fancy glasses, and I found a picture of these glasses, and I just had to laugh this week. (laughs) I know what you're thinking. That's a sharp-looking dude right there. (laughs) Dan Marino all the way, baby, the Dolphins, if we got any Dolphins fans in here. But I remember getting these glasses, and the first thought I had was, oh my, I've got to go to school the next day with these beautiful metal things with the giant bar across the middle of these. Now, that wasn't in style back then, if you were curious. That was for, you know, my parents thought I was going to break them pretty easy, and glasses were expensive, and so they had to get the ones with the most structure to protect me from breaking them. Thank you, Mom, and thank you, Dad. But I remember what it was like when I left the eye doctor, and I had these nice, beautiful glasses on. Uh, What was making me sad at first because, because of these glasses quickly turned into excitement because I remember walking out the door, and I can remember exactly where I was at, and I walked out the door, and I looked up, and I saw trees. But I didn't just see trees. You know what I saw? I saw leaves. It was incredible. I was amazed. It was like I was seen for the first time. I'll never forget. We got in the car, and we started driving down the road, and I began to just read out signs over and over the road signs. I began to read them to my dad, and he was thinking, what are you doing? I'm like, the signs have words, and I was reading them. Like, I've never been so excited in my life to read road signs. It was a very, like, it was a, I don't know what you call it. It was an experience for me because I could clearly see for the first time. If you can imagine, I didn't know that I was blind. I'd never known what it was like to actually see clearly. I'm using this example this morning because my fear is, as we begin to talk about missions, I'm not just talking about this church, but the American church in general I fear may have some blurred vision. We may not be able to see clearly what's going on around the world. So my hope is, is to help us see missions through a new lens and a new perspective, and upon seeing through this new lens, become aware of our previous blindness and be spurred on in clarity to what's ahead. So a new perspective and a new lens, that's my goal this morning to help us see clearly for the first time. So to do that, I'm going to introduce this idea of two cliffs. I think we have a picture there, maybe. I want to confront you with two truths today. We're going to keep it pretty simple. Two truths. But these two truths, I believe, ultimately demand a response. So as I was thinking through this and trying to come up with this, I just pictured, for some reason in my mind, There was these two cliffs, and on one side of the cliff, the first truth we're going to confront you with is the exclusivity of the gospel. The exclusivity of the gospel, exclusiveness. Now, when you first hear this word, there could be either positive emotions or negative emotions attached to this word exclusive. I mean, after all, we have exclusive offers, we have exclusive clubs, we have exclusive vacation packages. And when we're thinking, when we're included into those exclusive offers and those exclusive clubs and those exclusive vacations, this is a very positive emotion for us. 
But then on the other side of this, it can also be a very negative word. Because when we're not included into the exclusive offers, clubs, and vacations, you can quickly see how negative we have of this word. All right, so uh, when we were traveling through at some point in our journey, I don't even know, we went to a lot of airports and a lot of different times. One time we ended up in Paris in the airport and we, we bought this, this nifty little credit card. We didn't buy it, we signed up for it, I guess. And it got you into clubs at the airport, like airport lounges. Has anybody ever been to these airport lounges? It's a really cool thing. If you haven't done this, I would highly encourage this because it's amazing. You go and you present your card and it's free if you have a certain credit card and you can go into these lounges. And then on the other side of those doors, it's like full buffets, free. The refrigerators are lined with all the soft drinks and the Schweppes that you want. If you haven't had a Schweppes, I'm, I'm sorry, try one. It's awesome. But as many of them as you want, you can sit there the whole time you're waiting for your, your, uh, your airplane to leave, and you can just drink all the sweeps you want to, you can eat all the food you want to, get all the desserts, and it's free. You know how expensive airport food is, right? This was incredible. It was a mind-blowing experience for me. So we went to the Paris airport, and, you know, we're walking in there all kind of, you know, like, wow, this is good. Where's the clubs at? And so we get to the club that we, we think we need to be at. We can see through the door, and there's a full buffet. There's drinks in the refrigerator. Like, yep, this is our place. We go up and present our card. You know what? I wasn't able to get into the exclusive club at the Paris airport. And so I had to walk down the hallway to the club that I was able to get in, and I got a pack of yogurt and a juice box. And in that moment, I began to understand, like, the, the, the exclusive club is a great idea until you're excluded from it. And those feelings that we have are not so fun. So when we're using this word and we talk about the exclusivity of the gospel, I think it begins to tug at our emotions. Many in our, our modern Christianity, we struggle with this idea of the exclusivity of the gospel. We want it made available to all. We want everyone to go to heaven. I mean, except a few people, right? No, okay, everybody. We want everybody to go to heaven. Okay, we'll go for that one. We, we do. We don't want to exclude anyone from this. Even our enemies, I think we would say, yeah, I want them to go to heaven too. But we have to wrestle with the question, is Jesus the only way to heaven? You know, for most of us in here, I feel like this is a very basic question with an extremely obvious answer. Thank you. But if you look through scripture, or if you look through society right now, the Pew Forum on Religion did a survey, and they found that 52% of American Christians believe that people from other faiths will actually go to heaven one day. That practicing Buddhists and practicing Hindus and practicing uh, Muslims will actually, in fact, go to heaven. They say all major religions are equally valid and basically teach the same thing. 52% of American Christians, that's half of us, over half of us. Each religion sees part of spiritual truth, but none can see the whole truth. That's the narrative that's being pushed out even among Christians today. I don't know if you've heard this question or not, or this perplexing question they call it. I was faced with this perplexing question once upon a time in an in a interview at a church a long time ago when I was becoming a youth pastor for the first time. And they asked me this question, what happens to the innocent man on a remote island completely cut off from society, having never heard the gospel of Christ? When he dies, what will happen to this man? Will he go to heaven or will he go to hell? After all, he's never heard the gospel, so he's not had a chance to be saved. Will God hold him accountable for something he did not know? Matt Smether says this, your view of missions, for example, in terms of both its nature and its urgency will be directly shaped by your view of the man on the island's fate. What happens to this man on the island that has never heard the gospel? Will he go to heaven or will he go to hell? If we look and we survey our world today, there's really three views that come up when we try to begin to answer this perplexing question. Now, I'm not going to, to take you to missions class 
you know, we talk about all the ins and outs and, and all of these words, but I do want you to be aware of these three terms. It's exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. These are the three stances that you can take on what happens to the man on the island. You may be familiar with the word pluralism, but it's really a universalism, you may have heard it called. The man on the island, he's going to heaven because every person is going to heaven is what pluralists say, no matter what he believes. All roads lead to the same place. So if you worship uh, or if you're in Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or just any sense of morality, whatever path you may be on, they're all going to meet in the end with the same universal salvation. That's pluralism. The man on the island, he's going to heaven. There's another view we can take. It's called inclusivism. This is a very interesting view, and I think this is where a lot of people, the 52% would probably fall. They say the man on the island, he's most likely going to heaven. God's salvation must not be and cannot be restricted to only those who hear the gospel and consciously put their faith in Christ. Because they say, after all, the practical implications of such a restriction would necessarily mean that the vast majority of human beings who have lived on earth never had the opportunity to believe in Christ and therefore are doomed to hell. The inclusivists, they affirm that salvation will occur through Christ. This is where it gets really interesting. They affirm that it will happen through Christ, but apart from consciousness. Jesus' blood will be applied to them even though they followed another religion. But because they followed this other religion zealously, God will look on them and think, okay, you, did, you, you, you worked with what you had, so I'm going to now apply Jesus' blood to your life and let you into heaven. So someone who follows Buddhism, never having heard of Christ, could one day be saved because he followed Buddhism well. That's what the inclusivists would say. Now, there's the last one here, exclusivism, and we can leave missions class for a moment. Exclusivism claims that the man on the island upon death will enter a Christless eternity filled with pain and suffering. They believe that there's only one way of salvation and that it is exclusively through consciousness, consciously having faith in Christ. And if you think about it, it's, it's distinct from pluralism in that it does not teach a universal salvation or the possibility of salvation apart from Christ for adherence of other world religions. It teaches, that both, it teaches both that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and that all people must respond to the message of the gospel consciously. You have to hear the gospel of Christ and you have to respond consciously in faith to be saved. So as we're seeing this man on the island, as we're thinking through this, this scenario I've kind of set up for you, what happens to those who never hear the gospel as we look through these few views, I think you, I know which one you probably land on, but I also think this is what Scripture clearly teaches. And for this, that's why I chose John chapter 3 this morning. Look in verse 17 if you got your Scriptures. Look back at verse 17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Follow the train of thought here. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So God didn't send Jesus to condemn. He sent Jesus to save. Look at verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. All right? So whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This condemned already is the word that I want to focus on for a moment. Condemned already, you got you to have a little bit of a Greek lesson here. It, it's in the perfect tense. And we're going to make this really easy. The perfect tense in Greek is used to describe a completed action which has ongoing consequences. It's not just a simple past saying that something occurred in the past. It's saying, yes, something occurred in the past, but it has ongoing consequences in the present and even in the future. Whoever does not believe and put their faith in Jesus, it says, has already been condemned. They are currently condemned and will continue to be condemned in the future. This word literally means separated or excluded. 
So they are separated and excluded. It has occurred in the past. It is continuing to, to occur and will continue to occur in the future unless something changes. Unbelievers are not condemned because they do not put their faith in Jesus. They are condemned because of their sin. That's so important to realize. Jesus doesn't come in and condemn the world. The world is currently condemned. Souls are already condemned. Jesus is the answer to the condemned world. He is the one that saves them from their condemnation. And if they do not put their faith and their trust in Jesus, they will stay condemned. But we think, how can God punish the innocent man on the island? That doesn't seem fair. And I love what David Platt says to this. He says, there is no such thing as an innocent man on an island. You see his train of thought. He's not innocent. This man stands guilty in front of a holy God. Jesus' work saves us from the trajectory that we are currently on. And think about it like this. If this man on the island could go to heaven without ever hearing the gospel, why would we ever take the gospel to him? If he stands in his innocence on his way to heaven, and yet we think, let's send a missionary to him and tell him about the gospel of Jesus, and upon hearing the gospel, he now has a decision to make whether he accepts it or rejects it, and if this man rejects it, then he's going to go to hell. Why would we ever want to confront him with that choice, if you're following my train of thought? Let's leave him alone. He's going to heaven. He's good. Let's not go to him and tell him anything. So even practically speaking, it doesn't make a lot of sense to believe anything but the exclusivity of the gospel. And if we're not truly convinced, that's why I chose Romans. If you look over Romans chapter 10, verse 13 is an, an amazing promise. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's an incredible promise that the scripture is telling us. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But I love looking at this verse from the bottom up. So if you're looking down there in verse 15, if you follow this train of thought up, he says this, if they are not sent, then they can't preach. And if they can't preach, then they won't hear. And if they don't hear, then they won't believe. And if they don't believe, then they won't call on Jesus. And if they don't call, then they can't be saved. Church, I believe this is a really hard teaching but I think it's a very clear teaching in Scripture. I think the Scripture boldly proclaims and teaches clearly the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that without hearing the message of Jesus Christ and responding consciously in faith, people cannot be saved. We must be confronted with this truth of the exclusivity of the gospel, and if people do not hear, they can't be saved. I know you may be thinking here, oh, Paul, that's, that's great. I appreciate you for taking 20 minutes of my life to explain to me something that I already know. Well, oh, that's part of church sometimes, right? But here's the point. There's another cliff. On one end, we're okay. Yes, Jesus is the only way. We, yes, we believe in the exclusivity of the gospel. Without hearing about Christ, someone can't be saved. We are perfectly okay with believing that. But here's the deal. There's another truth that I want to confront you with, and that's the reality of unreached people. When we were going on our, on our work across seas, we heard this so many times you know, from various people. They say, I don't need to go across the world because there's lost people here in Mayfield. We would have people actually ask us, why are you going all the way over there? There's lost people here. And statements like this would begin to reveal, like, I think the church has a sense of blurred vision. We're not clearly seeing what's going on around the world because there's a significant difference between lost and unreached. I think I've talked about this at some sermon, at some point in my time here at First Baptist, but it's a truth that I want to confront us with again this morning, that there's a difference between the lost and the unreached. Yes, there are lost here in Mayfield, and we should be laboring to share the good news with them. But there are vast areas 
of our world that are considered unreached. And to be unreached means that your people group has less than 2% believers. There's not enough Christians in your people group to sustain a movement. So it's likely that inside of this people group, people will live and die without ever hearing about the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not only lost, but they have little to no access to the gospel. It's not readily available to them by anyone who is witnessing Jesus Christ. It's not readily available in any print form, and it's not even readily available in any digital format. They don't have access, and if nothing changes, they will continue to be perpetually lost. If you're thinking how this looks globally, I got a picture here. We have green zones, and we have yellow zones, and we have red zones. The green zones are where we'd say there's a, there's a large enough Christian population that can sustain a movement. If you think about America, we would admit that, yes, there's, there's a large amount of, of churches and Christians here that people have access. They can go to other churches. They can look on the Internet freely and find what they could. They can see in print form. They can read to know what the Bible says. These are green areas. They have access to the gospel. They hear. Now, whether they choose to respond in faith or not, that's up to them. But if we look at these red areas, these are the areas that people don't have access, that less than 2% of this whole red area are believers in Christ. Now, I realize you haven't ever lived in one of these red areas, and for you, it may be a little difficult to understand what it's like to live in one of these areas. I think what happens so much of the time, our world becomes the world, but that's not the case. Do you know a third of the world has never even seen a church, a Christian church? A third of the world has never even laid their eyes on a church. Think, how is that even possible? I know before the tornado, you could walk out of the front doors of First Baptist Church and think in your mind, now, how many churches could you see instantly? Methodist, Christian, Presbyterian, if you go behind the building, Yahweh Baptist. Within a, a block, four churches. A third of the world has never even seen one, and we had four that we could see. Our world is different than the world in these red areas. When we lived in Dubai, it was, a, it was a city of almost six million people, some of the most advanced architecture that you could possibly imagine, one of the most advanced societies that I've ever been a part of. You know what was not there? Churches. You know how many churches are in the city? One. There's one church building in the whole city, and it's so far down south that you never even see it. And this is one of the most advanced, one of the most uh, non-conservative cities in all of the Middle East. There's one church. And it's hard for us to kind of understand this, and I have this example to help us. Here's what it's like to live in an unreached area. I've asked this before, so hopefully you've been a little educated on this, so you might have somewhat of an answer. But if you have your paper here, your sermon notes, jot down the answers to these questions here. On your paper there, tell me what you know about Siddhartha Gautama. All right? Write down, what do you know about Siddhartha Gautama? Who has ever heard of Siddhartha Gautama? Okay, here's the bad thing. I've talked about Siddhartha Gautama before when I'm preaching. So I know you've at least heard the name, but you didn't remember probably, right? Okay, I'll give you a little bit of grace. But there was about two people that raised their hand. I thought many more would know about Siddhartha Gautama. So then my second question was going to be, what are the attributes of the Eightfold Path? Can anyone in here name one of the attributes of the Eightfold Path? You don't have to say it, but just raise your hand. Can anybody? I see none for those taking notes. All right, what about this? What are the five pillars of Islam? If anyone knows the one of the five pillars, raise your hand. I see one, two, one. That was Jim pointing to the guy that raised their hand. What about this one? How can someone escape samsara? Is there anybody that can raise their hand and say, Paul, I know, what it, I know how someone can escape samsara? Anybody? 
Because these are not obscure religions that we've never heard of. These are, in fact, the most popular world religions in the world. Islam is almost as large as Christianity. Buddhism is extremely popular in a lot of these red zones. Hinduism is, is practiced by millions and millions of people. This is not some obscure religion that I'm asking you about. These are the famous, most practiced world religions, and you know virtually nothing of them. You don't even know who Siddhartha Gautama is. is one of the one of the greatest philosophers of the world has ever known. Millions of people worship this man. Do you see the point I'm trying to make? That when you mention Jesus Christ in these red zones, they know as much about Jesus as you know about Siddhartha Gautama. We think, how can we escape samsara? When we say, how can someone be saved? They know as much how to respond to that question as you know about how to escape samsara. When we try to to speak the basic attributes of the Bible, something that that are so familiar to us, it's like them saying to you, name the eight attributes of the eightfold path. We can't name one of them. But I could ask you, what are some verses in the Romans road? You could start spitting them out, couldn't you? Church, I want you to begin to see that our world is not the world. We live in a very unique and different place in these green zones. Praise God for it. Please don't hear me. I'm I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. Praise God that the gospel has been so saturated here that we know who Jesus is, and we know the attributes of the Bible, and we know what it means to be saved. But for billions of people, three billion people around the world, they don't know. They haven't heard. They know virtually nothing of Jesus. And I know we hear these statistics, and we just think they're they're so overwhelming, three billion, and they just become a statistic. But what if these statistics were people? What if these statistics were people that you really liked? What if these statistics were actually people you admired and loved? I know we've had a unique experience, but I just want to impress this upon you that these three billion people who have never heard that are destined and dying to go to hell, they're real people. They're people like Muhammad. Let's see this first picture here. This guy on the left here, Muhammad. I don't know if you can tell by his smile. He has one of the most affectionate smiles that you've ever known. He's one of the most welcoming, hospitable person that you will ever meet in your life. He loves to have to go out with his friends into the desert and grill meat. He loves playing volleyball. He gets a group of friends together every week to play volleyball and organizes it, brings snacks and refreshments, and rarely does he ever play because he wants to make sure the games keep going on. This is what kind of friend this guy is. What about this next picture? Some of these pitch people in here, Ali and Fatima. Ali and Fatima, they love their children just like we love our children. They love going on weekend outings with their family. They own businesses in the community. They work in the banking industry. They're upstanding members of the community. They're extremely normal people. What about this next picture? Amira and Amal. These are some of the most precious girls on the face of this planet. Their laughter is incredible. They're so fun to hang around. These are where our most favorite people that we would get to hang out with with our time in Dubai. They love working out. They love going to water parks. They love food. They would seek out just different restaurants to eat at. They love going and watching fireworks. They love playing cards. And most of all, they love s'mores. The people that I showed you here, they come from Saudi Arabia, from Iraq, from Jordan, from Palestine, from Pakistan, and from Algeria. Just the few people that I showed you on the screen represent 375 million unreached people. 
That is a larger number than the entire population of America. The vastness of this unreached world is beyond comprehension. And if we believe in the exclusivity of the gospel, this should break our hearts for Ali and Fatima, for Muhammad. It should break our hearts. Because the truth is, if we believe in this one cliff, yes, the exclusivity of the gospel, we, we, we don't even mind believing in that truth. Yes, Jesus is the only way. John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Because on the other side of the cliff, we have to realize that there's a world of unreached people. And I hope you're seeing now why I use the cliff, because there's a gap between these two. And I want you to begin to understand, the church, you are responsible for this gap. God has ordained and chose that his message of salvation be delivered through the means of human agents. That's you. And that's me. He's ordained the church to proclaim his message so that people could hear to be saved. My goal this morning, church, is that you feel the responsibility. Whether you like it or not, as a Christian, you are implicated. R.C. Sproul says it like this, no one can call upon Christ to save them if they don't believe in him. Paul puts his finger on the challenge and the responsibility of the church to sin so that people might hear about Christ and upon hearing might believe and be saved. Church, we are responsible for these truths. We are implicated by the scriptures. If we truly believe in the exclusivity of the gospel and we truly know that billions will never hear the gospel we have to respond to this information. We cannot sit quietly. That's why I love the statement from Adonai Judson, one of my heroes in church history. If you haven't ever read it, I would encourage you to make this your next book that you read this summer, To the Golden Shore. It's a missionary biography of Adonai Judson. He says it like this. How do Christians discharge the trust committed to them? They let three-fourths of the world sleep the sleep of death ignorant of the simple truth that a Savior died for them, content if they can be useful in a little circle of their acquaintances. They quietly sit and see whole nations perish for lack of knowledge. I don't want that statement to define First Baptist Church in Mayfield. I don't want our church to sit quietly and watch whole nations perish just because they don't have the simple truth that Jesus died for them. Church, we have this message that can save their eternal souls. These people that I showed you on the screens that are real people that will enter a real hell and suffer for eternity. We have the message that can stop that. Let us be responsible for that. We look at Adonai Judson's life. He felt that responsibility, and he gave his life so that others could hear. And if you ever read his calling, he was, he was called with one verse. There was one verse in Scripture that changed everything for him. It was in Mark. It says, go and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That one verse. He felt the responsibility of that verse, and he knew that verse applied to him. And so he left. And he went to proclaim the gospel among the unreached. Church, we're going to ask and we're going to consider a few things next week about the implications of this, more of the practical, now what? But just as a teaser, I want you to begin to thinking, how are you leveraging your life here to spread the gospel among the unreached? How are you, church member, leveraging your life for the spread of the gospel among the unreached. This should be a question that needs to permeate everything that we do. I want to end this sermon, if Paul wants to go ahead and, and come up. I want to end this sermon by a quote from Charles Spurgeon. It's going to bring us back to the innocent man on the island. It's going to bring us back to the exclusivity of the gospel, but it also finds a way to, to bring all of these concepts together with a major challenge to the church. 
Charles Spurgeon said this. Someone asked Charles Spurgeon, will the heathen who have never heard the gospel be saved? This is how Charles Spurgeon responds. It is more a question with me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not can be saved. Let's pray, church. God, I know your word is so challenging, Lord. It convicts me. Lord, you know of the the pain, the anguish that I even feel leading up to this. God, to hear the cries of our friends, to one day envision their suffering, God, and I just pray. I pray for this church. God, that you would use this church in a mighty way to proclaim your truth to the unreached. God, raise up this church. Raise up members from this church. Raise up this body to accomplish your work so that our friends can hear. God, I pray this in your name. Amen.